Hello and welcome to the Yale Books blog. Join us as we sit down with author Sue Perdue to discuss her latest book on Strindberg, her recent shortlisting for the Samuel Johnson Prize, and why Strindberg is still important today. Well, um, really, there have never been more productions of Strindberg's plays um, on in London. And so clearly, <laughs> he's speaking very much to the modern reader mm. and the modern theatre goer. And I think that the, um, the key to that, I mean, obviously, Ibsen and Chekhov as well are enormously performed and enormously relevant, but the difference between Strindberg and um, Ibsen and Chekhov is that they were much more interested in the conflict of the individual within society, whereas Strindberg was much more interested in, quite simply, the conflict within the individual, the complications of being a person and interacting with another person, and so his plays are heavily psychological, he called them battles of the brains, and they're often two-handers, and not so concerned with big questions in society. Yeah. So, Which was quite inventive at the time, I mean, and, and you discuss it in the book, how he talks about, um, in term, he talks about his work as, in terms of dissecting the yeah. person that he knows best, and it all takes an almost scientific approach to the analysis of his, analysis of his own psyche. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, because, I mean, you have to remember, uh, well, up till really the late 1880s, early 1890s, um, he was a realist. Zola was, you know, the guy in literature. But at this time, Strindberg went to Berlin um, in 1892, and he fell in with a crowd of scientists and artists, including Edvard Munch, and they were all questioning what it was to be human. 30 years after Darwin had published. And there was a reaction, not against science, but against scientism. They felt that the scientists had like taken over the priestly role after God had died. But of course, science didn't have all the answers. What about the subconscious, the unconscious? Where did ideas come from? What's the line between sanity, insanity, and creativity? And that was why Strindberg looked inside himself, as Freud was looking inside himself at, at that time. In fact, they attended the same lectures in Paris. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Munch briefly there, mm. and obviously you worked, and produced a significant work on him before this. Mm. Um, I, was wondered, I was wondering what your personal relationship with Strindberg was compared to your relationship with Munch, how you approached the writing process, and how the two characters, how you feel about the two characters now? Um, writing process is very different, because Munch was my first biography. I'd never written a biography before, so it was quite frightening, really, <laughs> organising all that real information. Um, and so maybe I was a bit more cautious, I was much more structured, I went from A to Z, you know, historically. and. Um, so then by the time I, I, I came to Strindberg through Munch, it was only, I thought that he was the most interesting character in Munch's life, and there was this coming together, as I said, in Berlin, when the two of them came together, bang, and it's the moment of the creativity. That summer, Munch paints the scream, and Strindberg has just written Miss Julie. So it's, a, it's an absolute climax, really, of a certain form of culture. And so I knew it from Munch's point of view, and um, I wanted to know from, from Strindberg's side. Mm. And I was wondering also what surprised you most about the Strindberg's life. So obviously you knew him through Munch, as it exactly. were. Exactly. But I'm sure you discovered things as you got into it that perhaps you weren't expecting to. Well, I was expecting to write the life of a villain and a rather unpleasant man, um, and a misogynist, and a... Um, a hater of Jews, and, uh, and um, I, found, um, I found an extraordinarily sympathetic and vulnerable human being who was, I mean, uh, yeah, he, he, he said terrible things about women, but uh, it was only when he was provoked. He was a tremendous enthusiast. I mean, he started 
one of his books started with 30 points for um, the rights of women, including, you know, equal education, votes to keep their own property on being married, to be allowed to be paid for jobs and so on and so forth. And then this book was prosecuted, in fact, by the feminists, because he was proposing too much equality for women and it was very frightening. Then, um, after that, he gets furious with the feminists and explodes and says terrible things about women. But then, of course, he, um, that is really what gets taken up against him. Strindberg was married three times, he divorced three times too, mm. but each of his wives, to the end of their days, absolutely adored him, and he gave them all the freedom to follow their careers and so on. So it's a very complicated picture. And we mentioned already recent productions of, mm. of Strindberg, and uh, Juliette Binoche mm. starred recently as Miss Julie in the Barbican, yes. which would have been fantastic, fantastic production. Um, do you think there's something specifically about Miss Julie that makes it stand out, and if so, what? Well, I think, um, obviously, at the time it stood out. I mean, it is extraordinary to think that it's not until that magic year, George Orwell year, 1984, that it was actually published and expurgated in Sweden, you know, a hundred years after it was um, you know, first written. Um, but um, it is, actresses love it. I mean, you know, I've got Meryl Streep on the cover of my book. It was, it was, uh, she was, I think, at, at Vassa, I think it was in her second year, it was one of the first things she did. And it's just such a big role for actresses, you know. It'll never go away. And that's, you know, talking about Strindberg is, someone sort of at the forefront of ideas and things that have become topical now. I mean, roles for actresses in plays is always something that's, you know, there's always a shortage of great, you know, standout roles. When if uh, perhaps male actors, there's, mm. you know, a, a, a endless list of roles that mm. are known to be great. So maybe that was something that will keep Strindberg, you know, or should keep him in, a, in the popular yes. consciousness because it is a great role for a female actor. Absolutely, and again, it contradicts the idea of Strindberg the misogynist. So, the Samuel Johnson Prize, we were at Fours last night briefly. Um, just tell us how it feels to be recognised in that way. And Utterly astonishing. Mm -hmm. Completely, you know, just when you think of the number of. Um, non-fiction books that are published in this country and you think of the standard it's uh, you know it was amazing to be on the long list it's you feel like a winner if you're on the short list it's just um, it's beyond words really finally and in the interview you did with Samuel the Samuel Johnson prize um, you mentioned there's perhaps three book ideas that you're you're thinking about obviously it's been a whirlwind uh, with the munch um, mm. sale mm. and now um, the Strindberg book mm. but is there any chance you could give us a hint of what those some of those three ideas might be um, well um, actually this summer I did an Ibsen road trip um, because obviously you know the big three Scandinavians are you know um, Munk and Strindberg and Ibsen so that would have been the logical one um, but I knew that after he died, his wife Susanna um, burnt all the letters, she burnt everything, and she got in touch with his intimate friends, his girlfriends, and she said, destroy, destroy. And so although I had a very fascinating time at the Ibsen Museum, where I was particularly the, the curator of the Ibsen Museum, there's always been this thing about, was Ibsen illegitimate? When his mother went to Denmark, did she have the affair that gave rise to him? Anyway, the curator of the Ibsen Museum, a fabulous man, got in Tancred Ibsen, who's his grandson, Sigu's son, and he said, look, let's settle this, let's DNA test you. And so he did, and um, it turns out, in fact, that um, Ibsen was, um, was legitimate. And the other thing that I was talking to him at length about is this great thing about, there's no doubt that when Ibsen wrote Ghosts, he knew about how venereal disease works. We had a long chat about that, and, and he's, you know, absolutely proven the case for that, which is a marvellous thing. So those two things were terrific. However, when you get to Ibsen's life and all the stuff that Susanna destroyed, there's not enough 
to write a new biography of Ibsen um, because I love to do the connection between the internal life and the external, and she's really destroyed the inside. So no Ibsen, sadly. But at least I know, you know, there's nothing better than knowing. And then there's another biography that I'm kind of dancing around. And then there's another, um, I think it might be quite good to do a bit more of a fruit salad, an overview of what they call the modern breakthrough um, in Scandinavia, which was, I mean, now Scandinavia is the coolest country on earth, you know, and, and it was then too in the 1870s, 1880s, and that would be a pretty exciting moment to, um, to look at as a whole.